This is the Volleyball Coaching Wizards podcast, covering everything coaching. Motivated and inspired by interviews and conversations with some of the world's great volleyball coaches. To learn more about the project, visit VolleyballCoachingWizards.com. Now here are your hosts, John Foreman and Mark Lebedew. Welcome to episode six of the podcast. As I mentioned in last week's episode, we've got Ruben Walsheen uh, continuing a discussion about some of the things that he heard and saw at uh, a coaching seminar in Buenos Aires in Argentina back in the summertime. Um, the, the focus this time turns to more kind of at the specific coach level, um, whereas last week we were talking some somewhat more in kind of a cultural side of things. This time it, it kind of delves more into the the perspective of, of how we coach and and kind of our attitudes toward our position as coaches and our, our learning and and how we present ourselves and and uh, you'll you'll hear humble being used uh, several times um, and we also talk in general about coaching education and, and how that kind of happens in different places in the world so um, here we go um, all right let's let's Flip over to Velasco. Um, you said he was talking about the just the the results and trying to keep everybody's head kind of on on straight mm-hmm. after winning the, the Pan Am. Um, but you you've also talked about how he's very consistent in his message anytime he talks. Yeah, exactly. Um, for me, uh, the good thing about listening to those seats guys was that everybody is a really successful coach, consistently successful because they are getting good results along the years. Mm -hmm. And with getting good results, it is not only the meaning of winning gold medals. They are in some sort of uh, podium from many years ago. At every competition they are playing, they are always at the top teams. Mm-hmm. They are always with the top teams. So definitely, as a leaders, they have a kind of consistency on their work or daily work and a consistency on the things they are talking every, every now and then that people are fully convinced around to go to achieve the, the targets or the goals they are setting or they are setting as a team, for sure. But... Um, and also what is very, very important is that perhaps from the six guys, uh, one, of the, of one of them maybe is not the most remarkable, on my opinion, not the most remarkable guy like a synonym of team leader, mm-hmm. but all of them are really good team leaders and they are not over the team. They are part of a team and always remarking that because they have the possibility or the bless of working with a good team, they are getting good results. Uh, and for me, this is also a very remarkable thing because they are winning every now and then, but they are still really humble and, and hungry to keep winning, <laughs> but never putting their name over the team. Do you think this is... Uh... Uh, some part of the Argentinian character or this is some part of the uh, Argentinian coach development or this is just six uh, individuals who are uh, great at coaching volleyball and were all born in Argentina. Thank you very much for the compliment, Mark. Um, I would say that it's a kind of pattern that we had or we follow as a volleyball coaches, or in most of the team sports we have in the country. Mm-hmm. Uh, I cannot speak about football because I know a lot of uh, a lot of people who are working in, into the professionalism, uh, but I, I know pretty close people from basketball on the top level of the Argentinian country. I'm, I can speak about, uh, of course, volleyball a lot, and several other team sports like us such as uh, field hockey, even rugby, that we are really strong as a team. We would never be able to win as an individuals. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And this is a, I think this is a characteristic of our team sports uh, uh, from the country. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Well, that still begs the question, though, is are those guys successful because they're humble? I think so. I think so. Uh, because for me, it's a, in these kind of events where 500 coaches from all over the country are coming, of course, everybody reacts differently. But those guys, before, during, and after the conference, they were spending a lot of time talking to people that they don't know at all, like they would be knowing each other for many years. Um, and this is a thing that, for me, has no price, because they treat you like a pair, not like, like someone who is coming to ask you as a guru, you know? Uh, and I don't know, after the conference for me it was funny because I was coaching Fabian Armoa's son some years ago in Argentina. So I know him a little bit. Uh, but after the conference, he went with his girlfriend somewhere else for a dinner. The place was closed and they end up eating with us. Mm -hmm. and, and they sit down with us. And we were talking like, hey, Ruben, how is it possible that you cannot beat Friedrich Safin in Berlin? <laughs> and, and these kind of things. So he knows everything. Yep. And it's because Mark was there. Probably. Yeah, but the, the point is that they don't make you feel that you are far away. Yep. Even if you know that you are sometimes far away. Uh, and I think that's, for me, really remarkable. Because we can sit down speaking about everything. And they will, they will never tell you, no, you have to do this, this thing because I do so. They will somehow inspire you to do things looking for the answers. I, I think that, and Mark, you can tell me if you agree or disagree, but I think that actually is kind of reflective of most of the, of the interviewees that we've had so far on the Wizards Project, is they're happy to talk about anything and everything and not be preachy about it and not say this is the one way you should do it. You should do exactly what I do and, and all that sort of stuff. They're, in fact, some, some of them just flat out are interested to get your input. I, I, uh, I agree and think that one other thing that we talked a lot about that came through from the from a lot of the interviewees was the willingness or the desire to continue learning, uh, to continue to improve, to continue to develop. To develop. And um, I think that that mentality takes, requires a, a certain amount of humility because if you think that you're already the best, i.e. if you're not humble, then you have no reason to continue to, to learn and to improve. And um, I think that's a a great quality of uh, of a lot of the coaches that we've talked to. Yeah, that's for me the key of success. Yeah. Um, coming back to the, the topic of uh, Julio Velasco, mm -hmm. who definitely is one of the top five guys all over the volleyball history for me, mm -hmm. uh, even though I'm Argentinian, I never been with Julio Velasco more than three minutes, mm -hmm. yeah? uh, because it was not so. I know a lot of the top coaches, but I was never with him sitting for a coffee, for example, because mm -hmm. I was not having the possibility. Mm -hmm. uh, but for me, is that uh, those guys are always talking that, or oh, Velasco was highlighting when he came back to Argentina that. Stop talking this trash that I'm working better than the other one, or we should do this instead of that. And he said, every Saturday, we have the possibility to measure ourselves on the games. Then the results are telling how good we are or how, how, uh, how much we need to still work in. Yep. And also, another thing he remarked every time is that 
in professional sports, sometimes the message which is given that the only one good is the one who only wins, it doesn't give you the, the correct feedback for the ones that perhaps are making the good job, but unfortunately it's only one team, the one who wins. Of course. So, that we also should remark the process to get to the success, which sometimes is not giving you the gold medal right away, but it, it, it will give you a lot of good results along your coaching career. Uh, and he was also remarking this point, stressing this point, even though two days ago in a, in a newspaper he got a, a new interview, um, telling something that we have to remark that in order that the young people get also a good example. Otherwise, uh, he was setting a kind of example with the uh, athletic or the track and field when they yeah. go to the Olympics. Mm -hmm. They prepare themselves that they will win the Olympics, even though a 100 meters guy knows that he doesn't have any chance when Hussein Bolt will be at the starting point. Yeah. But they will be happy if they can improve their marks. Mm -hmm. So, which at the end, it's a victory for them. So, That's uh, one problem with the uh, with team sports like volleyball, though. It's much more difficult to to measure the improvement. It's much more difficult to compete against yourself. If you're a swimmer or a runner, you can you can really compete against yourself every day. And okay, today I was one second faster. Today I won. But uh, in volleyball, did he give some advice how to measure that? No, no. I think that. The consistency of this message, it's, I think, the consistency of uh, the team spirit or the teamwork. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that also, of course, this message uh, would have an answer if you, at the end, start to get good results. Otherwise, you are doing the wrong work let's say. Uh, but what he always stresses is that if you are working good, sooner than later you will get the results. And, and this is a thing that also two days ago he, he said at, and at this interview, very interesting, that uh, he said something like, okay, you can have information. Nowadays we can get a lot of information. Mm -hmm. But to give a consistent message to a player, you need to have the experience. You need to know about what you are doing. Otherwise, players after he said something like, they will scratch a little bit the painting and when they will see under the painting um, just a rotten wood, they will mm -hmm. realize that your knowledge is not pure. Yeah. If they scratch the painting and they find good wood, they will follow you wherever you want to go. Yeah, during, during his high performance, or one of his high performance clinic uh, presentations, he talked about the coach's job always is to convince. Exactly. And you need credibility yeah. to convince. Yeah, yeah. And the, the credibility comes after your know-how, after players really believe what you do and they see also the results. And it's not about talking too much. It's just, I would say, talking less and do a lot. Yeah, they need to see the progression. Yeah, yeah. There's a, a quote from, uh, or a story about Mourinho that I always remember when he, uh, when he started to work with 
I guess when he started to work with Barcelona, like the second coach or the mm-hmm. or the third coach, and he would prepare the the match plans, the the tactics, or the maybe not the tactics, but the review of the opponent. And uh, he said, well, one of his players said that every time Mourinho wrote something about the player that would or the team they would be playing, it was right. And the players understood that straight away. If Mourinho says the uh, in this moment the player will kick will kick with his left foot and he kicks with his left foot, then they will follow him. And uh, if he kicks with his right, then he doesn't have the the credibility. So exactly, you have to begin with the know-how, with the education, with the development. Mhm. Mhm. Yeah. Yeah. For me, this is the the thing. And um, also, uh, he's really happy and he stress this thing about his happiness to keep working with young people and young athletes who develop every now and then. And it makes him feel also younger. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I think this is also very interesting. And at the moment, at the, particularly at the conference, on the on the coaches, he was not speaking anything specific. He was somehow uh, tending to to keep all together because uh, traditionally we are also having a lot of internal divisions mm-hmm. because everybody thinks that it's better than each other anyway. We work as a team very good, but internally we have a lot of disagreements, let's say. Yeah. And one of the things in, in this conference was that the spirit of union was unbelievable. Yeah. Everybody felt together. And and I had coaches talking underneath like, wow, I was expecting that he will throw a bomb, but everybody was having a message of unity. Uh, which was also really, really interesting because uh, the result of the Pan Am Games Mm -hmm. for Argentina is something like uh, also Velasco needed to win in order to keep the credibility up or on because otherwise in two weeks would have been maybe coaches or players judging him not as a great coach <laughs> because he hasn't got the gold medal yet. Yeah. And so in these terms also, I think the gold medal will help on the volleyball growing a lot. What have you done for me lately? <laughs> what have you done for me lately? Always for, the, for coaches and players for that matter. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that's... Uh, for for everything in the sport in Argentina, it's just great. We we got a lot of exposure on the TV, on the radio, on the newspapers, and yeah, that's definitely great. Like the German team in the European Games. Yeah, exactly. That's the difference. Uh, what I can see, with all my respect, because I'm, I've been, we've been talking many times this maybe this topic, Mark. Uh, Mm -hmm. I think you know somehow my opinion, but we don't have such events anywhere except in Italy here. I'm attending the seminar that you were coming with me two years ago to Spain, which is one of the rare cases all over Europe that there is every year consistently working for the last 15 years a coaching seminar. Um, and in a country like Germany, I would say that we really need to go for such a thing. I, I know that England doesn't count in this discussion, mm-hmm. <laughs> at least in terms of volleyball uh, strength and power. But actually, that's one of the things they've started to develop as an annual coaches conference. Yes, because they, they should, have yeah, they have the um, express goal of creating world class caliber coaching which is ambitious, to be sure, because I think you, you need a certain uh, critical mass of, of 
experienced players, highly experienced players at, at a good level to develop a, a good, solid coaching cadre. But you got to start somewhere. So, you know, if they can build it up through generation by generation. Yeah, I think that the Volleyball England is doing a good effort about that. Perhaps the prices might be a little bit lower in order that uh, European people can attend those seminars. Because spending £1,000 for a weekend... Oh, that's FIVB stuff. Yeah, anyway. That's, that's what marks them. Anyway, anyway. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, that's just a comment. Perhaps someone from Volleyball England will listen to and they will decide to make it more popular. The, the stuff that they do internally, um, I think the, the coaches' conference is... is it's basically a one-day event, which is combined seminars and, and on-court stuff. Um, it's either free or very, very small price. The FIVB stuff, like the, 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 the seminar Mark did, or the FIVB one and two courses, those different price tag, yeah, they're expensive. Yeah, but uh, another thing which is important on out of these seminars that it happened in Argentina is that the seminar started at... 6 o'clock p.m., mm -hmm. but for us, started 10 in the morning, 10 a.m. I met friends who are coming from different points of the country that we met nearby the, the club where the seminar was organized, and we had lunch, of course, talking about volleyball, a coffee after the seminar, and a dinner. So it was almost a 24 hours day, whole day, where you are exchanging ideas with everybody. And again, I can, I can say that I'm coaching on the high level, but I'm still listening to coaches I had, friends who are still working with junior level clubs who are really, really good and they are still teaching me things because out of these exchanges we are only getting good input right. and this is a thing that I'm really missing since I'm in Europe overall uh, that these kind of things are not happening so that's why uh, I'm really thankful when we have the possibility to sit down and speak longer about volleyball with any colleague because I'm very happy. That's why always I invite coaches to our trainings because I'm convinced that I will be learning a lot of things out of that. Right. Yeah, it's, it's interesting in the States, you've got the, the long running thing is the ABCA yeah. convention that they do along with the Women's Final Four. They eventually added one in the spring that goes along with the Men's Final Four. It's a smaller event because men's volleyball is smaller. Um, the the focus of the the one that they do in, in line with the women is is I think they they specifically took an academic model to it, and you've got sort of tracks and you've got all these seminars going on at different times and you kind of have to pick and choose. And there's a huge catalog of who's speaking and on what topics. The the USA Volleyball High Performance Clinic takes a very different approach. It's a, it's a one track, everybody goes to the same sessions, you all eat together, all the meals are together, so you can be sitting with people from, in some cases all over the world, I know I had lunch one day with an Aussie who would come all the way just for this clinic, uh, I, I had breakfast with Kessel at one point, um, I had a lunch with Sue Gazansky at one time, uh, you, you could be sitting with Julio Velasco, you could be sitting with Lauren Tilly. Carlos Karai, any of the members of the USA staff. So for, for a lot of people, they, they opt for that clinic because of the interaction. And there's social events that are that are built into it too, which, which they also do with the ABCA convention. But I think a lot of the rub on ABCA, and Mark, I think you've, you've kind of touched on this at one point or another, is that it's very heavily dominated by college coaches. Mm -hmm. And so you don't necessarily get the diversity. Well, the, the IBCI conference, I went to the spring conference for, for men and that was, it was only college coaches plus coach, plus one national team coach. So it's, it's by Americans 
for Americans, from Americans. Um, that's pretty much that's pretty much it. And I don't mean that as a criticism. It's a it's a compliment in the sense that their coaching or their volleyball is so broad that they can year after year find 15 new different coaches with the the experience and the quality to make those presentations and uh, they miss out on a, a little bit on diversity perhaps but um, inside America there's there's enough diversity as it goes on but to go back to Europe a little bit the there are other um, other presentations other courses I, I know of uh, the Dutch Coaching Federation uh, pr has a conference every year that's uh, that I, I spoke at one year last this year was uh, Vladimir Gribich for example so often in English the Belgian Coaches Federation also regularly has uh, has weekends and with with the uh, presenters from outside that are open to anybody but but probably they're not widely um, widely promoted. Added, promoted yeah yeah because you know mark i'm open to go to those places every time i can which is almost every time i know so yeah. i have never heard about the dutch and belgium conferences well, there you go yeah and and this is a thing that, yeah, they should definitely promote better. And, yeah. and also, I don't know, sometimes I'm thinking that as a central country like we are in Germany, we should be able, we for sure have the capability to organize such an event. Yeah. Uh, I'm still dreaming for <laughs> But, yeah. Uh, also, it's it's regarding, regarding also the, the need that volleyball people will look for because if we don't think that is needed we will never organize it right. let, let me ask this question I know Germany has licensing uh, and isn't there's a requirement to, to coach in the Bundesliga right you need, you need to have the A license yes. yeah you have a, you need to have the A license and particularly in my case as a foreigner coach I need to renew the license every year. Okay. Um, what other countries? Italy, I'm guessing, has a license. Italy has a licensing, yes, and France as well. France as well. Okay. England's got something that's sort of required, but people don't always go by it. Um, the U.S. has its its licensing program, but it's not a requirement except in the juniors ranks and that's more for insurance than anything else um, but, but I'm sorry in uh, juniors you don't really need to have a license in Germany for example right you, no. you juniors can be coached by parents yeah yeah in the US you either have to have done the impact yeah. seminar which is only a four-hour seminar or been level one in, in cap and that's basically just for the purposes of insurance to be covered by USA Volleyball Insurance. Mm -hmm. Because if you're a registered club or a registered coach, you're supposed to qualify. Uh, in England, it, I think it's a bit the same way. They want you to be level two to coach a team for the insurance purposes. But my understanding is not everybody complies with that. Um, so I'm just curious to see how that works out. What about Poland, Mark? Is there any requirements in there? Um, there. For the first two divisions, there's a licensing requirement for uh, head coaches and assistants, um, but I'm not quite sure how you initially get the the license. Whether there's some qualification, I know that that uh, all coaches have to attend a uh, attend a conference uh, before the season to get the the validity for the coming season. So last weekend I was in uh, Toron at the, the Wagner Memorial Tournament where uh, we heard uh, Antiga, uh, Stefan Antiga speaking and uh, one of uh, Ruben's Argentinian friends, the the strength coach from uh, from Berhatu. So Was he good? 
uh, the the level, the overall level of the participants, it wasn't only this conference wasn't only for for professional coaches. It was also second and third division coaches. So it was aimed a, a little bit lower than um, than maybe my team. But uh, but mm -hmm. the presentation was good. It was organised, of course, and um, uh, had some good information. Is good, eh? Uh, yes. I think, or I've been told that, I, that there's, there'll be something, some requirement in Sweden as well, but I haven't been given the specifics of how that's going to work. Um, all right, we're, we're kind of winding up on time. Is there anything else, Mark, was there anything else you wanted to ask Ruben from the, uh, the conference? Uh, the, only, the only thing is uh, we, we focus mostly on, uh, on Weber and... Um, uh, and Velasco, whether there was something from uh, from one of the other presenters that that stuck out um, that Ruben maybe wanted to mention. Uh, overall, I I cannot really stress any particular thing. Most of them they were talking about leadership and management of a high performance team. Mm -hmm with a different um, approach, but most of them were almost around the same topic. Um, and yeah, to, to really stress anything particular, um, I cannot really stress any, any point. Uh, for me, it was very interesting what Fabian Armoa said, the coach from UPCM, mm -hmm. uh, that um, because coming back, uh, Fabian, it's a really, 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 really guy from a really normal guy. Mm -hmm. You will never listen to him speaking strange words. He will never uh, explain anything really difficult. He's almost using football vocabulary. It's really speaking from from a guy from the street, really from yeah. the street. Uh, and then the message from him, it's really direct. And it's really, um, yeah, it's really direct. Then, um, Somehow it can be funny when you listen to him the first time, but he's really intelligent. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, for me, it was also interesting how he he was telling the story. Okay, we were not playing good with the reception, so what can we do? We have to be pragmatic on into the solution. We need to bring a solution to get a good outcome. Yeah. So, and there was it. They needed to work convincing the players how to work on this idea, and they did it good because they weren't champions. So <laughs> I think that uh, that was not a, a doubt. But it was not a from a source or without a source was after doing a really careful research of the situation of the team. Yeah. So it was not just coming by luck. They realized after six, seven games that the quality of the team in one particular skill was not good. And they turned into looking for a right solution to get a good outcome. Yeah. There it was. So on the way he speaks, He's not really poetic. He's really direct. Mm -hmm. He's really punching your face like, okay, <laughs> we needed to do so, we did it. Yeah. And, and you know, because in a football game on the street where you play with your friends, and these kind of stories he's telling all the time. So he's uh, impacting the players also from 
from the world, from the message, but in a completely different message like Julio Velasco. Yeah? Uh, sometimes he's speaking, oh, you know, yeah, the number five from, from Trento. This guy who hits the diagonal good and say, eh, Juan Torrella, you mean? Yeah, 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 the number... And he's not a guy who doesn't know Juan Torrena. <laughs> but he will never highlight Juan Torrena like an impossible opponent. He will tell you, like, the number five of this white t-shirt. You know? Yeah. Like, he's a really human like you are. And if you do your things good, you will beat him. And it doesn't matter whose name is. There you go, Mark. You, you, you brought up the question why American coaches refer to opposition by their numbers and not by their names. Maybe that's the reason. Yeah. Um, and, and this is, yeah, and this is a story behind it. I have a, an internal discussion with my wife, who mm -hmm. has been coaching in a really high level as well. Yeah. And many times I'm telling her, oh, you, are, you speak like an old lady. Because she's, she normally speaks without, when, when the games, she normally speaks to the players never by the names of the opponents. Yeah. Only by the numbers. And there is a, mis a message behind. There you go. All right. And of course, I love her, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Might have to get her for a podcast, Mark. Ruben <laughs> keeps telling me she's the best coach in the house. Yes. She's really good. <laughs> All right. So you're going to change your philosophy now? You're going to start calling the other guys on the other team by number? Uh, because I'm humble and open to information and wanting and willing to learn, I will certainly consider it. <laughs> um, particularly on teams, when we play really, really strength, strong teams, many yeah. times I do the same. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, everybody needs to get off to uh, start practicing, yeah. practice planning. So we'll, we'll sign it off there. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed this episode. For show notes and more, visit volleyballcoachingwizards.com backslash podcast. Got an idea for a future episode or want to ask a question? Send an email to podcast at volleyballcoachingwizards.com.